Water is key to life as we know it. The discovery of water around distant stars and on distant planets is key to our understanding of whether a life could emerge elsewhere in the cosmos. Astronomer Stefano Facchini and his colleagues have found water vapour around a distant star where planets are likely already forming. We got the chance to speak to Stefano about how he made the discovery and what it means for our understanding of planetary formation. Well, hello, Ian. I'm Stefano Facchini. I'm an associate professor now at the University of Milan, and I'm an astrophysicist. And my research mostly focuses on planet formation. So I try to study both with observations and with theoretical models how planets form and how this can lead to the kind of diversity of exoplanetary systems we see today. It's an absolutely fascinating subject, isn't it? And the reason that we're speaking today is because of a recent discovery that you and your colleagues made, which is, yeah, quite mind-blowing when you think about it, the fact that you were even able to do this. As far as I understand it, it's the discovery of water around a sun-like star. I was wondering if you could give us an overview of the discovery. Yeah, absolutely. So the discovery is about managing to observe the kind of spatial distribution, so how the kind of how much water vapor there is as a function of you know the distance from the star. But it's not a normal star. It's a star that has been born not so long ago, probably about 500,000 years ago. So it's fairly young. And when stars are newly born, around them there is a kind of disk of gas and dust particles. And this disk, which we call protoplanetary disk, is exactly where planets are born. So the discovery is about managing to do a kind of image, a picture of the distribution of this water vapor around this newborn star. And so make a picture of this water vapor in the system which is actively forming planets today. So I think that's really fascinating. Yeah, and it's also, it's relatively nearby the star, isn't it? It's not too far away, astronomically speaking. Yeah, astronomically speaking, it's pretty close. It's about 140 parsec, which is the typical distance where the closest star-forming regions are. This is about 350 light years away for kind of the public listening. And it's fairly close, astronomically speaking. And that's very important for us because if the object is close enough, the signal we get in our telescopes is, of course, uh, much higher. And therefore, we are able to image this really because it is close. For much farther away systems, it will be extremely difficult. What made you pick that star in particular? So I would say there are two main reasons. The first one is this star, which is called HL Tauri, because it's in the constellation of Taurus, which has an actively star-forming region. It's kind of the most famous protoplanetary disk to date. And the reason is that in 2015, there was a super famous paper that came out, which was the first image of a protoplanetary disk at extremely high angular resolution, which means that we could see the disk at extreme detail from the facility that is called ALMA. I'm, we can talk about ALMA maybe later on. And the system showed the kind of very nice coherent structures of rings and gaps. And with some models, people understood that it's probably due to planets that are forming within this disk and that kind of sculpt the density structure and form these rings and gaps. So one of the main reasons was this system is really well known, is really well studied. The other reason is that the system is very young. And when it's the system is young, you have a lot of gas that is falling onto the star. It's falling also onto the disk, and therefore they heat up the surrounding environment. And to see water, you need to have fairly high temperatures above the what we call desorption temperature. So when the water goes from ice to gas phase, that's about 200 Kelvin, which in Celsius would be around minus 70. So the densities are very different from the ones here on Earth. So the, the water goes from ice to gas at kind of lower temperatures than here on Earth, and there is no liquid state. And so we picked the star also because it's warm, and therefore we were confident that if there was water vapor, it would be easier than in other systems to, to actually observe it. Mm. Yeah, no, let's uh, talk about the instruments that you used. So you used ALMA. 
Is there a particular reason that you would choose a particular observatory? And also, did you make these observations with it in sort of optical light or were you using infrared and, and different things like that? It's a very good question. So ALMA, it stands for Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. And that tells you already we're not in the optical. So this is an array of about 60 antennas. And they're located in the Chanantor Altiplan in the Atacama Desert at an altitude of about 5,000 meters. I don't know, in feet, about 15,000 feet, I believe. And the system, this facility works as a kind of collectively, this array works collectively as if it was a very large telescope. That's the idea of this interferometer. And it works at the light is not in the optical that the receivers are able to read, but it's a much, much longer wavelength. So very far from what we can see with our eyes. And it's at millimeter wavelengths or some millimeter. And why do we pick this kind of wavelength? The reason is that water molecule kind of rotates. And while rotating at very specific wavelengths, very specific frequencies or colors, emits light that we can clearly identify as due to water. This is a consequence of quantum mechanics in physics. And we know that there are two very bright lines, actually more than two, there are a few very bright lines that are exactly in the frequencies that ALMA can pick up. So we chose to go for this one, but there is one big complication, which I'm happy to say, is that in order to observe these stars, it's very difficult to observe them in the water transitions from the ground. And why is that? Because the atmosphere of Earth is full of water. And the water in the atmosphere absorbs the emission from water from the sky. And that's exactly also why we picked ALMA, is because it's built at 5,000 meter in a very dry desert. So the amount of water above the facility up to the sky is very little when the weather is very good. And therefore, we were able to get, to kind of pierce through the water in the atmosphere and manage to see water behind it. And that's extraordinary. That is. That's amazing. Which sort of brings us on to the question as to what exactly makes this discovery so interesting. Why do astronomers look for water? Why are astronomers constantly searching for water beyond Earth? Yeah, of course. I mean, there is, I would say, different ways to answer this question. Uh, the first one is that, I mean, we know that water is a key ingredient for the development of life because it's a very active, very powerful solvent. But of course, when we look for water in a system that is forming planets today, we cannot, and we do not, invoke that life may be forming there, right? Just to be very clear about this. But water is a very abundant, actually, molecule in the cold universe. And usually it's found in the form of ice on these dust grains. It's more difficult to see it in gas phase because you need these high temperatures that you can get through illumination of newborn stars or shocks you can get heated up and you can see this water vapor. But water plays, and that's how I would answer for my own research, plays a fundamental role in the formation of planets themselves. And why is that? It's because as you move from the star onto the outer regions of the disk, which is getting colder because you get farther away from the energy source. The water goes from the gas phase to the ice phase, okay, as you go farther away. Similar to our own solar system on Earth, the water is liquid. But if you move farther away to like Uranus and Neptune, it's in ice form, right? And the transition between these gas and ice phases, which happens at a very specific location, which we call snow line, water snow line, we think it's a very, you know, has conditions that can promote the formation of the cores of giant planets. And many scientists, I don't think there is a unanimous consensus, but many scientists think that Jupiter itself formed just outside this water snow line and that it played a very significant role in the formation of our own solar system. So what we did and what we're still trying to do to kind of follow up this research is now that we've 
imaged the distribution of the water vapor in the system is to try to really pinpoint the location of this water snow line and to see whether it's correlated with one of these gaps and rings that we saw, because that would be a pretty strong evidence or at least suggestive that a planet is forming exactly at this specific location as it happened, we think, in our own solar system 4.5 billion years ago. Incredible. So you can sort of use this distant star because it's so young and because it's like our sun, you can use it to work out what our own earliest solar system might have been like? Exactly. I mean, that's exactly what we try to do. What we try to do as a planet formation community is to look at systems that are kind of similar to, for example, our sun as it was at the very beginning, 4.5 billion years ago, and then try to see what are the chemical and physical conditions that can promote, support, or hinder the formation of planets. And in this way, we try to understand how our own solar system formed at the very beginning. And in a few cases, at least in one clear case, it's in another system, it's called PDS 70 We also managed to image two planets that are being formed. That's another line of research I do. And so you can directly witness the birth of another planetary system that is being born today as we speak. So could your observations tell you anything about where Earth might have got its water from? So that's more difficult. And it's, I would say, not really. And I'll try to explain why. So we know that Earth was formed, took a long time to form, took like roughly speaking, 100 million years. So it took a long time. And there are indications that, so, and it formed probably when the gas of this protoplanetary disk was all dissipated. So it had a lot of big rocks lying around, which we called like planetesimals, let's call them. And by colliding, once they kind of got bigger, like moon size, they started colliding and then they they selectively form some massive bodies. The other ones get scattered away. But we think that the atmosphere of Earth is what we say secondary. So the gas that is forming the Earth atmosphere is being brought here by these rocks with ices on them. It's not formed in the gas that was present in the initial stages of the protoplanetary disk. So somehow there is one point, though, that kind of goes into the direction of your question is that it's very important to understand the amount of water Earth has and where it comes from to really be able to say where this water snow line is, because that will affect the ice composition of these massive rocks that will eventually form Earth itself. So trying to kind of benchmark our modeling in actual systems where we can see the luminosity in the star and really see and determine where the water snow line is could be important to benchmark our models of planet formation in general and very tangentially at the end how these icy rocks may have brought water to Earth. Yeah, and with the planets orbiting HL Tauri, would you be able to say if they're orbiting close enough to the host star because there's so much water vapor, whether or not those worlds would be likely to have liquid water on their surface? So the system is still very young. So the planets we think are actively forming. We haven't directly seen any planet in the system yet. We have just only indirect evidence of them. But what we think is that there is a kind of massive gap. So really an area where we think a planet may be forming today, which has a lot of this water vapor in it. So if a planet is forming there, it has to be quite massive, more massive than Earth. But it's very likely that this water vapor is being deposited and being accreted into this forming planet. So what's happening is that this planet is receiving a lot of oxygen, and this oxygen eventually will form water, for sure, because it's a very simple molecule. You just need some oxygen and some hydrogen to form water. So if a planet is forming there, it's definitely accreting some water vapor. That's incredible. So how... Common, do you think a scenario like HL Tauri is in our galaxy or across the universe? I honestly think it's actually very common, but it's very difficult to observe. So we know that this 
water vapor in these inner regions must be present. And we have other indications and other amazing observations from other instruments that have seen water in many other systems. There were pioneer observations with the Spitzer kind of space mission and Herschel. Today with JWST, we have exquisite sensitivity to see water vapor in the inner regions of protoplanetary disk, and that's very easily observed. The difficulty there is that we do not have the spatial resolution to map the distribution of the water vapor. So we manage to see it's there. We try to model how extended it may be using different transitions, but we are not able to really map it out. But these observations do reveal that this water vapor is present in almost every system we observe, with very few exceptions we do not understand yet. So I think this scenario is very likely to happen in most stars, actually. Would you want to try and get observing time on web to look specifically at this R to complement the research you've already done? Absolutely. So we thought about doing that last cycle, this kind of observing proposals going cy- yearly cycles pretty much. At the end, at the end, I didn't do because I focused on other proposals. Uh, we got time, so I'm happy, but to do completely different things. But we had to focus on energies. But we'll definitely try next cycle asking for time to observe the star with JWST, and we're already discussing how to do that. And would there be other stars on your list to observe in the same way that you have done with HL Tori to build up a sort of database of systems where this is happening? Absolutely. So as I said, these are very difficult observations because they end up in a kind of atmospheric lines. So there is not a lot of time available, even if the amazing location of the ALMA site, you have like few nights per year to really do this kind of observation. So you cannot ask too much time. But last cycle for ALMA, we got time to observe three other systems in the same transition that where we detected water in HL Tau, and we try to observe systems that are really oxygen-rich. We see them from other lines, like for methanol. And we are fairly confident that once we get the data, we'll see this water if we made the calculations. If the systems are behaving as similar to HL Tau, we are going to see the water. So I'm looking forward to see the data. That's fantastic. I mean, whenever I hear about a story like this, I always just think back to the first exoplanets discovered in like the mid-90s. And now, like not that long after, it's just, it's commonplace now, isn't it? Studying and discovering exoplanets and it's incredible how quickly it moves, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The field of, I would say, exoplanets in general and planet formation as well is very fastly moving and evolving. You know, I remember when I picked this field, beginning of my PhD, that was now a fairly long time ago. Uh, It was 2012. And we didn't have yet these amazing images of protoplanetary disks uh, really showing this kind of indirect evidence of these planets being born. And after a few years, we started getting them. The first one somehow is really in those years. And now it's kind of routine to see these images. And to me, and it's just uh, unbelievable. And now we are at the level where as I mentioned earlier, we managed to see planets being born in this disk. At least in one case, it's, they're very clear. They're indisputable. And not only around one of these planets, a colleague of mine, and I was part of the research, we managed to image what we think it's the circumplanetary disk. So it's a disk around this planet that is likely forming moons. So we're getting to an era where potentially we're seeing moon forming systems. And that's just fantastic. It's like being explorers in nature, you know? Uh, That's how I feel. And that's why I love the the research. Phenomenal. That's absolutely fantastic. Well, thanks for coming onto the podcast, Stefano, and talking to us today. And, you know, good luck with all your future research. And I hope you make many more discoveries like this and hope we get to hear about them and and chat to you about them in the future. Absolutely. Well, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure to, to have a chat about it. Thank you. 